Welcome, everybody. My name is Martina Fox. I'm a business correspondent at China Global Television Network based in London and Zurich. Previously, I worked for Reuters uh, in the Middle East and for CNN Money Switzerland in Zurich. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I would like to kick off the next session now, which is going to focus on the Caspian Transport Corridor in the light of global change. And for that, I would like to inter um, view on stage um, live for you an exciting uh, list of panelists. So I would like to introduce them name by name. Mr. Barbara Badat, who is currently on the phone, closing some deal probably along the Caspian Transport Corridor. He will be with us. Dr. Andreas Baumgartner, former partner of the office of Tony Blair and Tony Blair Associates, advising governments of Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. Please uh, join me on stage. Matthew Briasa, former U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan, former Deputy Assistant, Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasia. Vladimir Kotenev, former Ambassador of the Russian Federation to Germany. Welcome, gentlemen. Mustafa Mastour, Minister of Economy of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. His Excellency, is he here already? Not yet? Okay, yeah, Davos Corridor is not very fast. Please, Bala, you are already introduced. Everybody knows you by now. Miss Tatiana Popova, lady, join me on stage. She's the CEO of the Agency of Strategic Programs straight from Moscow. Murat Seitnepesov, chairman of the organizing committee of the Caspian Week. Oh, you don't need an introduction. Talek Siadov, director general Baku International Sea Trade Port from Azerbaijan. We have a very diversified panel here. I don't know if we do this standing, but I think that gives us a little bit more flexibility. We do have chairs, so maybe we just step um, forward. But in the interest of time, I would like to start this right now. We have no time to waste. Uh, it's Swiss time. So I would like to ask each of you panelists um, the first question, which is how are you or your company involved in the Caspian Transport Corridor? Why don't we start with you, Butter? Um, microphones, please. Where are the sound technicians? How many mics do we have? We need, we need as many as possible. All right, but there you go. So how are you involved in the Caspian Transport Corridor? Well, uh, you see, I'm here today representing uh, FIAT. FIAT is the world's largest um, logistics organization, and it represents uh, Hang on, I think we yeah, we can take a seat now. Please, oh, gentlemen. Uh, I can be standing, no problem. Yes, you represent Fayata, and what are you doing along the Caspian Transport Corridor? Yeah. What, what we're doing basically is we're, um, Fiata is, the, as I said, it's the world's largest logistics and transport organization. It is in our interest to, to foster and promote connectivity on a global level. Um, Caspian region itself has been disconnected or has got a large disconnect. It's a landlocked area and uh, therefore the connect disconnect is very large. There is um, a lot of uh, effort going into creating connectivity with road structures, railway, pipelines, transmission lines. So out of the seven modes of transport, I think five modes are being addressed in this area. So I I'm, I'm sure waterways are not uh, probably as prominent over there and um, uh, the air corridors would be different. But there's a lot of corridor diplomacy going on there. There is uh, the, a pipeline diplomacy going on there. So a lot of uh, things are happening. So um, as, far as, um, as far as the organization is concerned, we are, um, 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 uh, we are the parent organization of the logistics industry. Mm -hmm. And we, we are working with different countries in the region. In the case in point, Turkmenistan is the country we work with recently in trying to develop their uh, infrastructure in soft infrastructure in transport and logistics. Yes. Um, Matthew, you obviously have a long experience in that part of the world as well. You've been a uh, former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan as well. How are you today involved 
in that part of the world, especially along the corridor, and maybe also what are the U.S. interests there right now? Sure, I'm involved maybe in three ways. <clears throat> One is academically with the Atlanta Council and analyzing and <clears throat> looking for business and political opportunities to foster regional cooperation. Uh, second way is uh, I, I have a joint venture based in Istanbul with a Finnish company that provides various environmental solutions like cleaning up oil spilled on land uh, in the sea. Azerbaijan has legacy oil waste dating back to the first oil boom in the 1850s and there's a, there are lakes of oil to clean up there. Uh, and then the last way, the third way, is together with Azure Telecom and in terms of this MOU just signed. And what, what's happening, Azure Telecom is spearheading uh, the development of a fiber optic linkage between data centers in southeastern Europe and Bulgaria uh, with Georgia, Azerbaijan, then under the Caspian Sea, uh, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and then onward, eastward, and, and then developing uh, further the internet marketplace uh, in Central Asia. And the whole idea is that the closer the data centers are to the market, the less latency there is, uh, so it means you have higher quality uh, da data transmission. And so eventually, we hope we could build, or they hope they could build, because I'm just consulting, uh, build data centers uh, somewhere in the South Caucasus as well. It's all about connectivity. That we know as well with the One Belt, One Road, or Idai Ilu from China, right? Now, Tale, uh, of course, you work at the International Sea Trade Port uh, organization and uh, talking about sea connectivity, uh, water connectivity, transportation, uh, the corridor is key for you. I will just mention uh, briefly, uh, gentlemen, ladies over there, could we please have a little bit of silence uh, to respect the panelists? Great. Taleh. All right, explain, Hello. give us an update on your projects I and actually, investments there. I actually had two maps and if I could pull them up so that for the audience to understand this. We have discussed about landlockedness, you know, Silk Road. We still discuss China's One Belt, One Road initiative. We can we'll see them there now. Not these ones, these are not mine. I have, I have two one, uh, one ancient uh, Silk Road and one the new one. This next 10 years, what is gonna happen? We'll get that up and running for sure. Yes, is it this one? This one? Okay. For you. For us to understand what's going to happen in the next 10 years with the China's One Belt, One Road initiative, we have to first understand what's the past. In the past, uh, Silk Road had functioned under economic logic, and that boiled down to camels, because there was no big ocean liners, no containers. Everything was done by camels. Camels and mules traveled about 40 kilometers a day. So every 40 kilometers, you have to stop. There was a hotel, Karwan Sarai, but a one-star, one-star hotel. Every 200 kilometers, you hit small townships. Again, Karwan Sarai, but three-star hotel. Your destination, first destination, was about 1,000 kilometers away, which was big megapolis. This was five-star. And you as a trader, you passed during your journey only two, maximum three hubs. So Bukhara, Samarkand, Merv, Baghdad, Aleppo, all these were five-stars. Action took place in five stars. Three stars and one star were only a transit points. Now I would ask for the second slide, which is what is happening today. Is obviously, today the majority of this trade is bypassing the central Eurasia. So 90%, more than 90% of trade between Europe and Asia is done by maritime, in large containers, large ocean liners. So what Actually, China and European partners and the regional partners are going to happen. This is the third slide. This is now the next. We are going to see emergence of different hubs across Eurasia. Istanbul, Mersin, Poti, Batumi, Turkmenbashi, Aktau, uh, Yekaterinburg in Russia, a couple of places in Bandarabas, Bandar Khomeini, Korgos at the China-Kazakh border. And Baku obviously stands in the middle of this hub development. Certainly we aim to become a five star. And our new initiative with the port, free zone, a future city and a future airport is a part of this hub strategy. But this is a win-win for all. So this five star, three stars or one stars, they are going to feed on each other. So we grow, they grow, they grow, we grow. So 
I look forward to seeing the emergence of these hubs in the 21st century. The world could be a happier place, indeed. Thank you, Taler. Andreas, um, you have been advisor to uh, the governments of uh, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and so on. It all sounds brilliant. Were there not geopolitics and other challenges and investments and so on? What are the major roadblocks that you are seeing going forward? Well, actually, I would love to start speaking about the major opportunities rather than just the major roadblocks. Start blocks. with the positive things first. Okay, please. And I honestly believe they're much more in the positive than they are on the roadblock side. Because what we are seeing right now is that the Caspian is just really seeing a revival of the great legacy of trade it had during the Silk Road times. And then again, the legacy, for example, of the uh, Caspian Black Sea Corporation and the Rothschild that's really started the activities there. Now, today, we're moving from being bypassed to being at the center again. And I'm also here representing the Caspian Black Sea Consortium, uh, for which Dr. Ziadov has just really prepared the ground perfectly. He has talked of hubs like Baku, but those hubs only work if the chain is not broken. And that's coming also to your question around challenges. It doesn't just need a great hub, whether that's three, five, seven, or whatever stars. It needs a chain that goes from, be it China, to Europe, be it North, South. And that's where players like the Caspian Black Sea Consortium come in, where we are building a port on the eastern coast of the Caspian, where currently there is no effective and efficient port of the dimension that we need. This is also, to speak of opportunity or challenge, a way and to create a new corridor for oil. Oil, for example, generated in Kajagan, coming through uh, Mangistau region in Kazakhstan, going into Azerbaijan and on to Europe, through Turkey, through the Black Sea. What does that mean in terms of challenges, to come to your question? Well, it requires the cooperation, cooperation of multiple governments with slightly different, but at the end of the day, very similar objectives. So it's a political project as much as it is a business project. So talking about the supply chain, um, Murat, I would like to ask you, how does then the corridor compete with China's Belt and Road Initiative, or does it complement it? How can you integrate it better? Uh, okay, uh, here I have two heads. First is uh, Caspian Week, second is Integral Petroleum. That's why. Talk from uh, both perspectives, uh, yes, if you I may. Yes, I will try to cover from both. And uh, Caspian Transit Corridors, uh, they are not competing, they are not complementing. Uh, generally, we can tell it's potential integral part of the Bel Belt and Road strategy. And here, also important the role of Switzerland, uh, because uh, Switzerland can be. Uh, uh, the country and Swiss business can really accommodate and then invest Chinese money to the Greater Caspian region. Because uh, the last April it was Memorandum of Understanding signed in Beijing for strategic cooperation between Switzerland and China for Belt and, uh, belt and Road cooperation for Belt and Road markets. And the uh, Greater Caspian region is exactly not even the market, it's the heart of the ancient Silk Road. Uh, that's why I think uh, both uh, these uh, initiatives uh, should be integrated very fast uh, uh, in one great initiative. Thank you. In that uh, sense, I would like to give the word to uh, Tatiana Popova because uh, she will introduce you to a very specific and practical example of what's going on on the ground that you are working on. Please. Thank you very much, Martina. First of all, I'm very delighted uh, to be invited by the organizer to be here. And thank you so much for this great opportunity. You are doing such an amazing event. So I'm very pleased to be here. So our company working together and under the government of Russian Federation and, and of course together with the Ministry of Transport of Russian Federation, our aim and goal is to develop inland waterways of Russian Federation. And I would like to talk uh, a little bit more about very interesting and important project for us. Can I have a s next slide, please? We have the slideshow of uh, Tatiana Popova yeah, as I well. Have a very, very short presentation. Yes, I think <laughs> I it's prepared. up and running. Yeah, so I have a very short presentation. Uh, my topic is uh, International Transport Corridor, North-South via Trans-Caspian Road. So basically why it's important, we are expecting the growth of uh, non-energy expert uh, by 2000, 
2024 uh, up to 250 billion dollars, including uh, industrial products and agriculture products. And we truly believe that the key and important role is river transportation. Also, I would like to give some figures. Uh, what is the potential of river transportation? As we can see from the slide, it's up to 20 million tons of export and transit to Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kuwait, Dubai, and India. So it's a very important project and very essential, I believe, for all countries around uh, this road. So as we can see from the map, that the South Sea Road, of course, much longer, and uh, the beneficial thing that the cargo delivery time uh, can be 17 days instead of 35, and of course, the cost of delivery less than $1,500. So we believe that this way is one of the main road for transporting goods from India, Southwest Asia, Africa, the Middle East to Europe and back, uh, without the Suez Channel. So this project for Russia right now is very, very important along with North sea, uh, Northern Sea Road and Trans-Siberian Railway. Can I have a second, sli uh, third slide? So, and here I just would like to show that we have a lot of different partners and countries who would like to participate and work together because we believe that it can be beneficial for everyone. And uh, this slide shows us that we agreed and signed a document with the um, Association of German Careers. And we're happy and will be happy to work together. And what I personally think, that this road can be <coughs> next step for sustainable development trans transportation for all parties around um, all these countries who are involved. So thank you very much. Um, I'm so happy to be here, and we are open for any cooperations and partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tatiana. I'm sure you will get a lot of interest after that uh, panel discussion, hopefully a lot of partnerships. Uh, Vladimir, I would like to come to you. You're the former ambassador of Russia to Germany. What kind of connectivity are you seeing you know, for such projects? What kind of potential are you seeing? And what are some of the worries that you have as well? Uh, well, we uh, talk these days uh, a lot about uh, this uh, connectivity and uh, uh, about the development uh, of uh, Eurasian regions. Um, mm -hmm. My vision is uh, first uh, um, the time uh, uh, came uh, for really a Eurasian, uh, very wide Eurasian cooperation on our uh, uh, in in our Eurasia because in um, Switzerland in uh, central and west Europe you, you talk about Europe uh, but Europe is much wider um, uh, Europe is just subcontinent of uh, Eurasia so uh, I think uh, this cooperation and the combination of uh, Obor of, uh, of China, uh, uh, People Republic of China, uh, with some project uh, of uh, Russian Federation of uh, Caspian uh, powers, of uh, Black Sea powers, and so forth, uh, it will be the future for uh, a world economy and uh, um, a, a great project, especially in infrastructure. Uh, all that uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Bada told us uh, will be the trigger for the world economy in the next decade. That's why I believe and, and I hope uh, we can also uh, connect uh, such initiative uh, like uh, uh, Black Sea uh, Cooperation. Mm. There is an organization, uh, it exists since years uh, and develops uh, programs uh, with uh, the um, uh, greater uh, Caspian region uh, and this combination can bring more ideas and uh, more common projects. Uh, I would see, uh, uh, for example, uh, the uh, highway uh, around the Caspian Sea. Uh, as we have this idea and we started already 
these uh, works uh, uh, in uh, the uh, Black Sea cooperation. Thank you very much. So what does the panel think what needs to be done in order to implement such a huge, massive project like a highway around the Caspian Sea? For example, uh, Andreas or, or, or Matthew, what do you think about that? Uh, oh, <laughs> you pass. <laughs> Okay. I, I've never thought about that idea um, because it seems so daunting politically. Um, politically, we, why? Uh, uh, different interests? Yeah, countries haven't worked well together um, uh, around the Caspian, yeah. Um, Uzbekistan, granted, is not on the Caspian Sea, but it's right there in the neighborhood and is important to all these regional interconnections. And until the current president, Mirzoyoyev, was in power in the past, President Karimov, was blocking a lot of this sort of cooperation. So the patterns, the muscle memory uh, isn't necessarily there. Um, as we talked about yesterday in the context of Afghanistan, um, there needs to be, there's, we, there's a chicken and egg dilemma. Uh, and as Mr. Baghdad likes to say, you, to, to foster political understanding, to reduce the risk of instability and warfare, the countries need to have a pattern of cooperation based on interconnectivity in terms of transportation and logistics lines, so they have something to lose if there's conflict. But <laughs> you can't get those patterns of cooperation as long as there's conflict. So it's a, if that can be achieved, it's great. But I think it would be really a difficult thing to achieve. But uh, you are nodding, and Andreas as well. Uh, Andreas first. I would strongly agree it's very difficult if you look at the historic track record, also at the widely diverse interests of the various players in the region and also some personal references, let's call it that way. That being said, at the end of the day, if there is something to lose by not cooperating, that might actually be the engine that we need to strengthen cooperation. And I would like to look at the class more than half full in this case. We have had the Caspian Seabed Agreement relatively recently. Now, five years ago, People said, well, that's never going to happen. And honestly speaking, it looked for a long time as it would never happen. Well, now it is there, and it has already helped to get a number of projects rolling by creating clarity. So maybe the class is half full, maybe the class is half empty, but there's at least some reason for optimism. Let's look at it as if it was half full. Uh, but our, let's zoom out a little bit uh, and look at this uh, Caspian Transport Corridor. What needs to be done on a practical level? Um, more regulations? Um, do we need to cut tariffs for some of the maritime and transport companies that want to do business? Um, what needs to be done now? Okay. Uh you see, uh, as my colleagues over here just said, there are a lot of challenges uh, that we have to face in trying to foster an uh, ideal environment, and it's never going to be ideal. So there'll be a lot of challenges to do that. Um, the, 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 the Caspian route, um, you see, a lot of the, they need to find um, ocean openings. And one of the routes, now I wear my second hat. I was uh, speaking to you before the head of the logistics organization, but now I go back to my country, which is Pakistan, and I run a business over there, logistics. Uh, the corridor which comes in from there, from the Caspian region, and we have discussed it, it comes through uh, Afghanistan to Herat, from Turkmenistan down to uh, Kandahar, and then into Pakistan and into the seaports. It's imperative that these seaport connections for the Central Asian region are developed well in a structured manner. And if you want prosperity in this area, if you want trade to promote, if you want um, uh, people uh, to connect regionally, global money has to find its way over there. There has to be development funding over there, and it has to be done in such a way that there is um, uh, that the, 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 the reason for conflict is minimalized. And therefore, it will move on. Now, if you give me a, a few moments, uh, we'll take, uh, we move to one belt and one road. There was a discussion on that today, and we spoke briefly about that yesterday. You know, from the perspective of a merchant, of a logistics operator, um, we feel, and I can say this is my, this is my feeling, that um, China was the world's factory. It was making everything under the sun for the world. In 2008, when the financial debacle came, the, the main markets stopped buying, or they reduced their buying. The US, uh, the United States, and the, uh, the European Union. China felt the pinch. So China stalled for a moment, and they decided that they're going to build their infrastructure within the country. So let's say between 2008 up to the next 
five-year plan up to 2013, if you took a flight, a daytime flight, anywhere in China, the whole country was dug up. Motorways, roadways, terminals, ports, airports, everything was being done. And they spent a colossal amount of money in, in, uh, in fact, the economies like Australia, which was supplying the raw materials for this growth, were booming. Australia didn't have a, uh, a, a depression for, or what, not a depression, but a, um, a, a, even a, a stalling of the economy for 35 years because they were just fueling this, uh, their growth also. So anyway, so a lot of mon uh, money was invested into infrastructure. Now that finished towards the end of 2012. When they finished that, they realized that they needed to go beyond their borders. Well, that's where in 2013, the One Belt, One Road initiative was announced. And that initiative actually went across to the markets where their products are going to be delivered. So as we heard in the morning, there is a shift, a global shift going on. It may happen, it may not happen. But as business people, we are obviously an arm's length at politics. The politics is someone else's job to do. But as business people, we watch these things and we see that what is the next step or what's going to happen. So in that context, I think um, what they've been able to do and what they've been able to achieve is going to change the dynamics of growth in this area. And there will be a huge connectivity. It's already there. Now, like, I, like, I don't know about last year's figures, but year before last, China's from the east coast of China to the heartland of German industrial heartland, France, <coughs> North Sea ports like Hamburg, UK, uh, Italian pros like Trieste, they sent 3,750 trains from the east coast, which means more than 10 trains a day. And this was 40% more than the year before. So Absolutely, a huge rise. I would like to move on uh, to Taleh um, because you work at an international um, association, basically, right, with uh, the Sea Trade Port. Um, and infrastructure investment is so crucial. It cannot only come from within the region, but it needs to be international. So how can you attract more foreign capital and um, you know, boost cargo, um, transportation, and foreign trade? First, your first question before that, got a pessimistic view from the, our Western colleagues, I would rather disagree. This region is going to boom in the next 10 to 20 years, and the conflicts, traditional conflicts and all that stuff, there has always been conflict on the Silk Road. Sometimes Mongols, two Mongols brother fought, you know, one route was closed, the other opened. This will remain. In order to avoid conflicts, you have to harmonize a lot of things. And this harmonization is not done just by building a road. It's done by building hubs. For example, Port of Baku is built. It's quite modern, quite large. In 2010, Turkmenistan had no idea to building a new port. And we were concerned. Why? Because our throughput was going to be 25 million tons. Their throughput was 10 million tons. And there was a concern. There will be a bottleneck. What Turkmenistan did, Turkmenistan also built another large port. Now we are aiming to fill it. You see, initially there was no idea of trying to cooperate maybe, but now we both want to cooperate. 85% of throughput in the port of Baku is transit. So I, I automatically want to have good relationship with my eastern neighbors. Yes? And you also rightly pointed out that cargo from China to Europe starting to pass using railways. So what I showed you on that map, you have to change the para paradigm of your thinking. You don't need oceans. A Chinese container comes to Baku in six days by rail cargo. Alternatively, through ocean, it comes in 30 days. So I can bring that Chinese container to Baku, open, take whatever is inside, add value in Baku, and then airlift it to Frankfurt, London, or whatever. I'm going to earn a time, so time sensitive, perishable goods, high tech, high tech goods are going to come and certainly these hubs are going to create it and then it's going to benefit all in the region. Tatiana, give us a sales pitch. Um, why should a European company invest in that region. You have an excellent network of contacts. You travel all the time. You're a very international lady. So why should you know people here invest? 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. First of all, I would like to say that a great Caspian region is essential for Russian Federation. And I also truly believe that only together and united we can achieve goals and everything. And definitely we should be partners with surrounding countries, every single country. So basically, in times of USSR, uh, water transport was very, very effective, and it actually was on the first place along with other transportations. And uh, as we have a project office, actually we have investment project office together with the Minister of Transport of Russian Federation, so I'm working a lot with uh, investors and investment projects. Um, it's uh, very important and essential to have something outside the Europe because mm -hmm. you know uh, we have many many possibilities in Russia together with the Great Caspian region even more uh, and I believe as we can see from the figures that cargo and uh, export transit everything will be increased so uh, it's it's a really huge opportunity for investors right now invest in this kind of uh, business and areas Vladimir, would you like thank to you. add something on that point? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, indeed, I agree absolutely. Uh, not only railroads uh, um, create uh, create uh, um, new markets, uh, but also roads. Uh, if if you get uh, all these goods um, uh, on railroad in Baku, you need uh, roads to uh, Iran, to to Turkmenistan, to to Russia, uh, to Georgia, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, I observe now in, in Europe, even in Europe, um, the new markets uh, um, uh, come to us, uh, for example, with, with uh, uh, the trucks. Uh, some prosperous Chinese uh, in West China uh, buy and order in Germany Porsches. And th they will be, uh, be delivered with trucks. And trucks come in uh, 14, as in two weeks. Uh, in Western China. It's a new market because otherwise uh, Chinese have to wait uh, 40 days or uh, longer uh, of their uh, very desired car. Thank you. Absolutely. I would now like to open uh, to the floor for questions. Um, I believe there will be a microphone circulating somewhere and a journalist friend of mine who is uh, just coming in there, I think also has a few questions to the panel. So maybe why don't we give the microphone to him first? All right. Please introduce yourself as well and who you would like to ask the question to. I'll do my best. Uh, Matt Bird with Equities News. Um, this question is for um, U.S. Ambassador, former U.S. Ambassador Matthew. Um, on uh, November 27th, you wrote a very insightful uh, report. Um, is Rosanoff undermining maximum pressure on Venezuela and Iran? Could you expand a little bit about some of the players involved, including Instex? Sure, thanks. I'm glad somebody read that article. Wow, that's <laughs> the one guy. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Matt. Maybe because we have the same name. Um, Actually, and it's a perfect lead-in to uh, a, a clarification I wanted to make to Tale's points. Um, I was responding specifically to the idea of a highway that goes all the way around the Caspian that I think is really challenging. Uh, I think East-West Corridor that you were talking about makes tremendous sense, and I'm, and I'm coming to the question, because uh, it proved its reliability. Uh, in fact, we started focusing on that as a, as a reliable way to transport, export oil and gas produced in Azerbaijan to Turkey and then onward uh, to Europe. Uh, then on September 12, 2001, so day after the attacks, I was working on President Bush's staff and he got a call from then Azari President Haidar Aliyev. And Haidar Aliyev said, we are with you in response. We are opening our airspace, our land corridor, anything you need, we are there with you. And that turned out to be a major uh, transport route for the US and allies into Afghanistan. In fact, one third of all uh, equipment was moving through there. Uh, to Afghanistan. So what I'm trying to say is the U.S. is far from the Caspian, but it actually uh, has some strong views expressed in President Trump's sanctions policy. I saw a map up here before. It's kind of a blunt map. Uh, there was a map uh, that had uh, two big red splotches, which were <laughs> sanctions on uh, Russia and Iran. And, and if, you, if it gets up there, you'll see, again, it's kind of a brutal depiction, but there's a, a nice corridor without any sanctions, which is Azerbaijan, Georgia, onward to the... It's back the up there again. It is. Yeah. yeah. 
And so that's the corridor of the pipelines that the U.S. supported together with Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey. And that's the route uh, from, you know, from the Georgian coast across uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, the Caspian, uh, and then onward to Afghanistan. So today, today Donald Trump, as I said in the previous session, is under lots of pressure uh, about his relations with President Putin, and he's seen and accused by his Democratic rivals of being too soft on Russia. So he's applied sanctions, and he has a, a policy of maximum pressure, maximum pressure on two countries, on Venezuela and on Iran. Rosneft is the economic lifeline for Venezuela. Rosneft, uh, Rosneft provides uh, not only a way for Venezuela to export its crude oil, the only company left, international company, to do that, but also is supplying Venezuela with its refined product, with its fuels. The only company doing that. Without that, I think you'd see the Maduro regime crumble. But there's no talk of sanctions against Rosneft. I'm not saying there should be. I'm not a big fan of sanctions. But there's no talk. So that is undermining um, sort of, well, Trump has also talked about maximum pressure on Venezuela. Okay, now finally, let's turn to the, back to the Caspian. Uh, in the case of the Caspian, um, there are, there's been a huge expansion of the capacity of the port of Mahachkala, and, and our Russian friends maybe will, will talk about this. Uh, for two years running, the volume of, of oil imported into Mahachkala has doubled. Uh, Rosneft, its uh, president, uh, Igor Sechin, has said openly that uh, we, my company, and our government would like to help you, Iran, undercut U.S. sanctions on you uh, by helping you find ways to export your oil. Uh, is that oil being exported via Mahachkala in conjunction with Rosneft? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Uh, but there have been some ships, some tankers involved, exporting oil uh, from Turkmenistan, by the way, uh, in a deal brokered by Vitol, uh, whose owners are under sanctions. So is it possible that that, that route, Iranian oil uh, through the Russian system, is happening in violation of sanctions? Will President Trump have to do something against it? I don't know, but very last point, Instex. Instex what is, it? is the instrument for trade through exports. So it's an EU initiative to help the Iran nuclear agreement stay together by providing a way also around US sanctions by having a trade mechanism based on barter rather than the exchange of, of money, rather than cash. So the dollar, in this case, uh, couldn't be part of that. Under EU rules, Instex cannot include oil. Tehran really wants oil included. So Right now, as what I said a few minutes ago, Rosneft is looking for a way, it appears, to, to help Iran get oil included uh, in the Instex e EU arrangement to get around e uh, U.S. sanctions. Election year, with Donald Trump having to look tough uh, against Russia, not saying that's a good idea, I'm not saying I'm in favor of sanctions, uh, but I, I, I think this could become a, a campaign uh, issue and maybe in obscure circles like mine, or, or, or maybe there are Republicans out there uh, like the ones that formulated the sanctions against Nord Stream uh, that may be on the attack. So watch this space. Thank you. Sorry for that long response. Thank you, Matthew. Um, did you have another question there, Matthew? No. That's fine. All right. More questions for our panelists. Please just uh, raise your hand, identify yourself, keep your question short, and then tell us who you would like to ask the question to, the gentleman in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Oleg Tsirla. We have a business here in Switzerland, and we're hoping to uh, work in Uzbekistan. Uh, my question is uh, an open question to the whole panel. I was wondering how you see cooperation in an information and digital space working to help promote uh, harmonization would it be closer towards building a joint system that every country can participate in, or perhaps trying to bring closer together the regulations within individual countries so then it's easier for businesses to navigate the legal landscape? Thank you. So boosting digital transportation, basically, right? Exactly. OK. Tale? I can take on this because in the uh, last three years we have been working on this. We are cre creating, together with OEC, we work with this regional project. We have a port community system, which is a fully digitized automated system. Uh, obviously, we try to share this with our Kazakh and Turkmen friends. Uh, so the first stage of it is to interconnect the ports. So now we are interconnected to, for example, Aktau, 
we exchange this uh, IT communication and all our manifests go to them and from them to us. Now we are planning to interconnect it with Georgian ports. But obviously for this to succeed, you have to have a platform. So when a container, for example, leaves China, I should in Port of Baku know when it's going to arrive to me so that I get my preparations. I think gradually, within probably two years' time, we are going to have that platform ready. And that should not be necessarily linked to one corridor. It's a platform whereby all logistic players, users are interconnected. So wherever you send your cargo, you have to know when your cargo is going to arrive. This is inevitable. This is the future and we are prepared for that. Would anybody, yes, similar, Tatiana? Is it similar to a railway information system which is uh, in the European Union exist? Something similar, yes, because we're also working on it in Russia. So it's a one online system for water transport. Basically that all, yeah, the logic is the same. So all cargoes, ships can do everything online. Very, very useful. So maybe you should discuss a potential partnership afterwards and team up together. Would anybody else on the panel like to uh, discuss digital transportation and the opportunities there? No? Okay. More questions from I'll the floor? Just yes, add one please. Element. Andreas. Uh, we're hearing a lot. I mean, the key topic of Davos this year is uh, sustainability, reduction of the carbon footprint. In a way, you could look at this panel saying, what are you guys doing talking about new pipelines, roads, railroads, etc.? Isn't that exactly contradictory? You tell it's exactly us. Exactly. Well, I wish I had the perfect answer, but this digital uh, integration is actually a way of making sure to at least reduce the footprint by optimizing processes. And I think that's where we still have a lot uh, to gain and actually to really start leading the way as we are building new infrastructure, more or less green field. Bader, let's pick up on this conversation because it is very important and you are a transportation guru. So what about sustainable transportation in that part of the world, but also if you speak from a global uh, perspective? I don't know about Guru, but anyway, I'll try and answer this question. You see, uh, environment is a concern which is global, but its impact is different in different economies. Where you have developed economies, your impact is um, the way you handle uh, and the priority uh, for environment is different. And in uh, less developed countries, the, uh, the priority of, of, of environment is different. So you cannot have a universal policy for all the countries. You have to see which economies can handle that better or what is the trade-off. So if they implement a position on, on or if they take up a position on an environment, it has to be a viable takeoff, I mean, a trade-off. So it, that is critical to, to, to any such uh, solution. So there can be no single answer to apply environmental uh, concerns on a global level. Yeah? Absolutely. We have, yes, yes, Tala, we hand over the mic, thank you. Just quickly, because since I give only practical what we have been doing, for example. This year, or I would say 2019, Porto Baku, we became first ecoport mm -hmm. certification in Europe. There are 34 ecoports in Europe. What is an ecoport? Ecoport is basically the port that is taking the environment and reducing the footprints on the on the environment. So uh, we have done actually we have been working for three years in the region. We became the first ecoport a mechanism that we also trying to share now with our neighboring ports. I think there is a clear, clear sensitivity with respect to environment. This is not just done for you know ticking the box. And whatever we do in the future, obviously, is taking environment into con consideration and making sure that we have much more sustainable logistic services. We have time for two more questions or remarks from the panel. Is there anything you would like to add to the conversation that we haven't talked about? Yes, Bader. Yeah, um, again, talking about transport, I think um, before, um, whether you have an industrial setup or you have an a, a, a agriculture setup, um, uh, whatever you generate for the economy, the critical thing is transport. And logistics connectivity is the most critical thing. So I think if this region is looking at, um, at, um, at some form of integration or some form of, um, of collective thinking, collective policy making, so I think transport connectivity should be the priority which can then take things forward. 
And I think we have seen this again in the case of One Belt Road and CPAC in Pakistan. $62 billion have been invested by the Chinese, um, out of which majority is for energy, and a lot of it is also for road transport. The next phase we feel is, uh, we hear is $150 billion of industry and in industrial estate. So similarly in this region, we have to think in those complementary ways and look at uh, east-west connect, even a north-south connect. I've met you the first time, brother, on uh, the road to Davos yesterday, and we had this discussion about CPEC in the car. I traveled it with uh, CCTV from uh, the uh, Pakistani-Chinese border down uh, to Karachi. So it is really incredible what's going on there and the uh, quality of road infrastructure, electricity, and so on that's happening there. And, uh, of course, uh, all the side projects with hospitals and schools and so on. I think Matthew would like to add something, and then Andreas as well. Actually, only if it was the closing remarks. Uh -huh. Closing remark. Andreas, you had something to say? Yes, there's just one quick thing I would like to add is we're talking a lot about the Caspian as a transit corridor, etc. Actually, the ambition needs to go far beyond that. It's about creating value by light manufacturing, manufacturing, etc., creating jobs. So this is not just a discussion of how to make the transit through the region as fast as possible. It is about how to attract opportunity to the Caspian, which allows those economies and thereby those countries to flourish, and thereby, honestly speaking, if we now kind of cross it over to politics again, become prosperous, stable, and thereby help global stability in a very, very sensitive region. The gentleman here in front has a question, I believe. Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Amir. I am representing uh, Caspian Container Company. Uh, I would like to have a question to Mr. Badat. Please. Uh, can you share some uh, of your information about Gwadar Port, which is going to be the key for the CPAC project and uh, one road, one uh, belt uh, initiative of China? What is the development so far and how do you see strategically for the commercial point of view? Thank you. Well, um, Gwadar is, um, used to be a small fishing village and it became quite controversial um, uh, when there was discussion about uh, various countries getting involved over there. Uh, fast forward to today, um, the Chinese have got a concession on that port, uh, they are operating that port, it's a very, uh, it's a deep sea port, it's one of the deepest uh, ports um, uh, in the world. So um, that port has got a, Chinese have got a concession on that, and it is a, a, a very um, it's the end point of the CPAC project. Mm -hmm. So as the Chinese are working in Southeast Asia, the Caucasus, and Europe, uh, the CPAC project uh, can, uh, you know uh, culminates at Gwadar port, or starts at Gwadar port if you're taking the pipelines up to China. Um, but it's a, a lot of work is going on over there. The first mm -hmm. transit containers have already moved out from Kashgar through Pakistan on the western route, through Gwadar, they've already been shipped out. Um, it's, not a, it's not sort of commercially as busy as it should be, but it's, a, it's not a one-day match if you know cricket. It's an it's a innings match, so uh, it's going to take a while. Um, but there is dialogue of other countries getting involved. China has got this, there are other ports in the region, you know, other countries can get involved. So especially the Central Asian, Caspian region countries, um, there is a discussion of them uh, take, uh, having their hubs over here and look at Gwadar as a transit. And I, as I just mentioned, and I think we discussed this, that from the Caspian region, um, from Turkmenistan or any of these places, if you come into Afghanistan, Herat, and from Herat into Kandar, and then Kandar into uh, Quetta and down to Gwadar, it's a very short route and it's a very viable route. So if this is developed, and a lot of this area already has um, uh, railway connections, m other areas need to be connected. So this is the way forward. I think um, uh, there has to be a lot of money on the ground for this and a lot of other planning, but that's the idea. Okay, so because we are going to start the next session very soon, we just give the closing remarks to Matthew, if you would like to uh, finish this session uh, with your insight. Uh, thank you. Um, I wasn't actually planning on the sum up, but thank you. Uh, the, um, look, these are grand ideas, and uh, government officials love sitting down and drawing lines on maps and dreaming about infrastructure projects that are going to bring everybody together. Um, and that's the, the sort of discussion you often have uh, in academia. 
This is a great discussion because it's totally different, right? This is about using private sector investment to do some grand things. Russia's got its strategic interest in the Caspian. Maybe there'll be this highway and river system. Sounds intriguing. China certainly has its interest and is becoming a dominant force. It's the one providing the most capital for these projects. And the countries themselves have mixed views, right? Some are comfortable, some want the money. Some worry about what comes along with that money. Washington certainly is in that category, right? Really worried about the broader strategic implications. Um, does Washington get a vote? Uh, Let's see, but Washington in the past uh, was unable to come together with a comprehensive vision that integrated across, it's funny, bureaucratic lines, whether it's in the US military where, uh, where the South Caucasus are under the European command and Central Asia and Afghanistan uh, are, are, are under uh, Southern command. So um, there are bureaucratic obstacles that reflect the US way of thinking that m make it difficult to come up with a comprehensive solution, but this is the only way it's gonna happen. When the people with the money and with the vision who can create jobs through infrastructure connections uh, are somehow working together with a common vision, as long as the geopolitics don't get in the way in a new great game. And with that, we close the session. Thank you very much to our distinguished panelists, to Caspian Week for inviting them.